you know, you don't want to grow bigger than the fee you have, but at the same time, you can't get more fee till you get more people. Business of Architecture, episode 306. Hello and welcome back, Architect Nation. This is Enix Sears, and I am your host on the show where you'll discover tips, strategies, and secrets for running a profitable and impactful architecture practice. Today's guest is Tom Sprinkle. Tom is the Director of Design and a Principal at HKS Incorporated in the office based out of San Francisco. He heads up the design studio for their hospitality segment. So without further ado, here is today's interview with architect Tom Sprinkle. Hello, Tom. Welcome to the Business of Architecture. Thank you, Enoch. It's a pleasure to be here. Tom, tell our audience, what is your role at HKS? Um, my role at HKS is I'm design director of the San Francisco studio. Um, HKS is a nationwide firm. We have 22 offices around the world. Um, San Francisco is one of our five offices in the Western region. Um, I'm design director here, which means I am responsible for setting design direction um, and uh, kind of corralling our overall conceptual approach to projects. Um, here for the um, hospitality, the multifamily mixed use, um, urban high rise, um, and uh, corporate projects is, is my purview. What's the history of the genesis of HKS? So HKS is, uh, we are celebrating our 85 year anniversary, 80 year anniversary this year. Um, it originated in a small office in Dallas. HKS actually stands for Harwood K. Smith, who was the founder of the company. So there's not three people, it's just one guy. Um, and he, he gave the firm his initials. Um, that was 80 years ago. Um, started out as a um, small firm that was also doing development. Um, it quickly moved to um, a regional uh, Texas firm. Um, started doing a lot of uh, healthcare work. Um, the healthcare work allowed us to expand um, throughout the country, uh, bringing in um, new people. And then as markets change and in the, kind of an attempt to, to be more nimble in the economic um, turbulence at, at times, we've expanded our, our market reach from initially almost 90% healthcare to now healthcare makes up about 20% of the firm. Um, and we have a um, broad range of market sectors beyond that. And were you around when there was that strategic shift from having more types of other projects that weren't healthcare? Um, by the time I joined, that um, the attitude about that strategic shift was very well in place. I and mean, we have a well-established sports group, hospitality group, um, aviation. We've, we've added and subtracted as it makes sense. But when I started, um, healthcare was easily still 50% of the firm, and um, we've managed to grow the other sectors now so that um, healthcare is still obviously a significant part of what we do, but it's not the majority of what we do. And Tom, in your role, how much is devoted to operations? How much do you get into that part of the studio? Uh, quite a bit. Our studio here in San Francisco is about 45 people. Um, I have two other partners here that we run the office together. <clears throat> we um, try not to stay. Um, we don't separate design and, and admin and, and um, or, you know, administration of the firm and management of the firm. The three of us um, partner on running things. So a lot of um, operations. Um, right now, I'm doing a lot of recruiting, which is you know, part of that. It's a skill that you're not necessarily born to sometimes, but... Um, it's necessary, um, especially now. Um, and then as far as um, running the office, I work with the three, with the other two, my two partners. And then we also have a um, reporting and uh, financial mechanism with our Dallas office, which remains you know, the corporate headquarters. So you mentioned your focus on recruiting right now. Tell me about your, your perspective and your approach when it comes to recruiting. Uh, well, I think, you know, uh, <clears throat> we, re we right now are recruiting at all levels throughout my career. I've been at HKS um, for about eight years. Um, overall, I've been practicing architecture in the San Francisco Bay Area since 1988. Um, I've run several studios um, at other firms, and I have 
done a lot of hiring, I think, throughout my career. I've probably hired as far as getting people in the door about, um, I would say, north of 70 people. Um, and as far as recruiting and interviewing, you know, that number is probably three to four times that many um, trying to find the right candidates. Um, at all levels, you know, it's, it's always a challenge. I think um, the senior level has um, probably um, been the most challenging for me. Uh, right now, we've got some openings at the senior level. I think the recession, you know, that hit us all pretty hard, um, 2008, 2009, 2010, especially in the Bay Area, um, a lot of intermediate levels that would have been you know, kind of junior coming up in the firm at those times left the firm or left the region <clears throat> and ourselves and, you know, my peers and other um, firms in town, you know, there's just a dearth of experience right now at that, uh, you know, I would say eight to 15 year, number of years experience. Um, it's very difficult to hire and find the right people. Um, the people that we have at that level, we treat, you know, like gold <laughs> and, make sure that they are happy and they stay here. Um, recruiting is um, something I enjoy. I like meeting new people. I like talking, especially to young people, especially coming out of school, um, three or four years experience, you know, understanding generation, generationally what they are all about. Um, you know, as, as millennials are starting to move into intermediate level position now, we're dealing with the Gen Z, which is, an, you know, kind of, uh, as far as I can figure out right now, a complete just reaction to anything the millennials like, so they don't like. So it's, it's a whole other mindset now we're having to adopt. And how do you find source candidates? Um, you know, it's, it's um, I, I personally don't think it's that hard to find candidates. I think it's, it's hard to find the right candidates. You know, there's social media. Um, like I said, I've been here in the Bay Area for 30 years. I know a lot of people. Um, it's fairly easy to reach out, um, talk to friends, talk to people, you know, who do you know, or who might be looking around that you know at other firms. Um, we have uh, sometimes clients recommend uh, people that they've worked with, that they like, that they know are looking for work. Um, you know, maybe consultants will do the same thing, or even we've had references from general contractors. Um, LinkedIn is a great source for us. Um, there is a lot of um, churn going on, on on that platform that um, we engage in. And I think uh, there's a lot of investigation, you know, before we really start even getting getting to the res resume phase. You made, a, you made a very great distinction there about maybe sourcing isn't as difficult as actually identifying the right, correct candidate. Tell me about your process for being able to discover if someone's a fit. And I'd love to hear a story about maybe sometime that it didn't work out and what you learned from that experience. Uh, sure. Um, I think generally speaking, they're, um, you know, on the, on the design fields, you know, it's not just a resume, it's a portfolio. So when I first um, identify somebody um, and get to the point where, you know, we wanna see a resume, um, I think there's two things I look for, you know, just graphic design of the resume. I hate to say it, but if it doesn't look good and there's misspellings, we don't move forward. Um, but then also, you know, what have they done? What have, have um, their level of thought about what they're putting together? And then when we move to the portfolio stage, and the interview stage, the two things I look for are, you know, uh, talent and hard work. And it doesn't really matter to me too much if they worked on the building types that I've identified as, you know, what I do, my expertise. I think smart people can figure that out. It's really those more innate and you know, less easily, um, I guess, less objective skills that uh, we really look for. And I've learned throughout my career, those are the two things that really um, lead to success. How do you identify those things? Oh, I think, um, especially at the portfolio review stage, just listening to how people talk about um, what they're doing, um, how they thought about it. Um, you know, one example um, would be uh, on the good side, I guess, I haven't given you the bad one yet, but on the good side, um, we had a young woman that came in. There's a, a previous firm I worked at 
about 16 years ago. Um, and we spent about 15 minutes of her interview talking about her thesis project, which was kind of um, floating plaster eggs in water and the inspiration that she drew from that and how that translated in the architecture and the, the amount of work she did, um, how much of a convoluted kind of process that was that she somehow got her head around, um, organized it, um, made a story out of it that um, was really compelling. Um, I just knew that she spent hours and hours and hours thinking that thing through. Um, and I can tell from, you know, people's resumes, is this, you know, this was their first idea or did they really go beyond and, and spend the time that um, designers need to do on their own? No one's making them doing it. They're just love the process and love the exploration and talking about um, a project that they've done with passion um, and in depth and thought. Um, it, it's, it becomes very obvious at the interview stage. And how important is to you something like their particular aspirations or a culture fit within the company when you're at that stage of trying to figure out who to hire? Well, I think, um, those are both, uh, as important as well. I think, um, the cultural fit, what we'll do is in, in our office here at HKS, we've kind of developed this process where, you know, once we have identified a candidate to move to the next stage. Um, we will actually, um, I'll set up a group of that person's peers, um, you know, four or five people that she or he would be working with directly, um, you know, maybe a little bit above, a little bit below them, but um, to come in and talk. None of the principals are there. It's just our staff and this candidate <clears throat> and talking about, you know, and I say, just ask whatever question you want, you know, whatever they'll be honest and you be honest and no one's listening in and, and just have a good conversation. And I think people that can do that, um, that can um, walk into a, a room of strangers and, and start to um, be curious about them and ask questions, not only about the work, but what people are like and, and um, start to, you know, maybe feel a little bit at home, even in an hour long setting like that. Um, it's, that's what we look for on the cultural front is um, people that are, are comfortable engaging on a social level, um, that are personable, that are um, not so design driven that um, you know, they kind of can't talk about anything else. Um, we do look for talent, but we also want a broad, um, broad personality, I guess you could say as well. Um, as far as um, questions that I ask, I think the questions that I ask in, in interviews, you know, are, are not anything profound, but one thing I always ask is, you know, I don't, I don't say what, what do you, where do you see yourself in five years or 10 years or any of those kinds of things that, you know, people are supposed to ask. I usually say, just, you know, describe for me your ideal job. What, if you could do anything you wanted right now, what would it be? Um, and surprisingly, um, I've had some people that can't answer that question. Um, I think they're um, either haven't thought about it or are not well prepared or um, for whatever reason have never really thought about things in that way. And I think that, um, you know, is, is kind of a, a telling thing for me. Um, it's not what, what do I want? I'm asking you what you want. You should be able to tell me. Are, are people able to tell you that generally? Most, most people are. I mean, most people will. Uh, take a stab at it and start talking. And then um, through a back and forth conversation, you know, we can kind of dial down a little bit, uh, you know, more specifics because I'm not looking for, you know, general comments, but really specific. What do you want to do? You know, what do you want to walk into the office? What's going to make you excited to come here um, and sit here for eight hours a day? Um, and, and how do we make sure that those goals of yours align with the position we have open? And also, you know, the goals that we have as a firm and as a culture and where, where we want to be um, with our people um, long term. In terms of your process and the hiring process there, is how much of it is done by the HR department or do you take it all on? What's the mix there? Um, I think we, we take on the first steps, identifying, finding and identifying candidates. We, you know, list projects or um, op um, position openings online. And we will have resumes, you know, come in through that method. 
um, HR does initial screening and then passes on ones that they think are um, relevant or maybe important or meet the criteria. Um, that's probably 25 to 30 percent. Um, the rest, I think we find ourselves through our connections. I think, um, you know, one of the challenges we have in San Francisco is uh, identifying local candidates. Um, if we identify out of state or out of town candidates, um, the kind of barriers to entry, if you will, are, are high enough that it, it really gives us pause about um, trying to um, get, especially on the junior level, um, someone like that to move to San Francisco. Um, we're very careful to explain to them, you know, there is a bit of a sacrifice involved um, to come here at, at a junior design architects level. Um, but I, I don't find that to be a deterrent, but it certainly is easier to find um, people and, and um, uh, bring them in who already live here. And you're referring to the housing costs and commutes and things like that? Yeah, housing costs, um, commutes. I think, um, you know, you're not going to move to San Francisco, your first job out of college and, and have your own one bedroom apartment. Um, you know, you, you, and I think most people understand that they'll need roommates and they'll have to make it work somehow. And, you know, that's what everyone does when they come here. You know, they go to New York, they do the same thing. Those desirable destinations, I think most people, especially in design professions, understand there is some sacrifice involved and there is a barrier to entry and it's not for everybody. Um, but those that, that come here and do well, I think, um, don't regret the decision. Do you do any personality profiling of candidates to try to gauge where they fit on that spectrum? Um, you mean in a formal, in a formal, formal way, way, a disc profile, a Myers-Briggs profile, anything like that? No, no, I really don't. Got it. And how does business development work there for your studio? Do you have, are, are projects coming to you or are you and your partners part of that process? Um, it's, it's a little bit of both. Um, we have um, some top-notch business development people here in the office um, that are not um, part of the three-person partnership group. Um, they provide um, discipline um, and coordination and a ton of support. Um, we have sort of a process of... Uh, uh, you know, everybody is doing business development, um, keeping their eyes and ears open, listening for things, talking to friends or, you know, building their own network. Um, when they feel it's appropriate, they'll escalate that relationship to the next level, which are really maybe a little more about betting or is there anything there? Um, when, and then when it comes to sort of closing the deal, that's when the partners really carry the ball. But we're all doing business development. Um, all the time, I think at, at the partner level, you know, it's probably anywhere from a, a 30% to 60% of our day um, is business development, um, you know, including one-on-one um, -on -one meetings, but also um, industry events and um, conferences and, and uh, those kinds of things as well. Yeah, I mean, that that's definitely quite a lot, especially when you're uh, helping to manage a studio, you're also in charge of design. Uh, sounds like quite a full plate. What would you say is for you the most challenging part of your role? Uh, well, I think um, I have learned to be a really good delegator. I think my uh, senior design staff that I lean on heavily, um, I, we have a great deal of trust in each other. The, the woman that I mentioned to you with the floating plaster eggs I hired at that firm, I hired at our next firm, I hired her here. We've worked together for pretty much that entire 16 year period. Um, I lean heavy on, heavy on her, we trust each other. Um, she carries a lot of the design load. I am in an oversight role with her. I'm moving um, other people in this office to that level where they are starting to own the client relationship on a project basis. And they're really starting to um, run the teams, uh, trying to mentor them to delegate, I think is a big challenge. Um, designers uh, tend to be people that like to do things themselves. Um, and I think that is in a way, a little bit of a, a career hindrance. I've discovered, you know, my, my job, and I think probably the hardest, my job, hardest, hardest part of my job is finding someone to replace me. So that's what I'm always doing. Whatever I'm doing right now, I, I want to find someone 
to do that for me so that I can move on and, and do bigger and better things. Um, the day-to-day -day business development, I think, like I said, I'm not necessarily the most disciplined um, in that field, but we do have um, people here in the office that help me stay on track. I do enjoy that part of the business. Um, I think the, the other difficult part is just, you know, um, it's, it's kind of the difficult part, but it's also the best part, which is, you know, every day is different. There's always new things coming up, new challenges, um, maintaining client relationships and looking for new client relationships. Um, it's, it's one of those balancing acts that um, uh, I'm still learning how to do correctly. It, we we kind of asked this question earlier, but can you think back on a time when you made a hire that just wasn't the right hire, and what you learned from that experience? Um, I don't I don't think we've ever really blown it. <laughs> um, I know we we have had people, um, maybe that um, I don't want to say uh, misrepresented, but had kind of a different understanding of what their role would be um, through the interview process, and then. Um, when they got in the door, um, maybe they weren't exactly highly qualified for that role. Um, you know, and I think it's, it's a discipline and I look back on those and I, I try to always check references and make those phone calls. And um, I think sometimes when you, you don't do that, you regret it or you can regret it. I mean, I, re I rely a great deal on intuition when I'm talking to candidates, but I think that um, kind of the um, meat and potatoes of, of calling the references and, and doing a little bit of online research um, really pays off as well. Yeah, yeah. I, I remember a story from my career. There was a, a, a woman who worked at a firm that, that I was working at, and on paper, she was like straight A student. And, you know, the resume, everything looked great in person. She was very personable, but she could not do anything. <laughs> Oh, and yeah. I, rem I remember when some reference calls came in and the principal of the firm kind of answers the phone and he says, hello. Oh yeah. Yeah. Okay. Oh, she's great. No, you'll love her. <laughs> <laughs> she's working here right now and we're sorry to leave her. Yeah, yeah. 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 So hopefully, apparently you haven't gotten any of those, but, um, no, that is always tricky. The, the role, the expectations. And so it's remarkable that, you know, you haven't had anything where it was like totally not the right fit and it happened that way uh, t talk to me about designs that you're involved in right now what is what are you seeing in terms of what clients are wanting in the sectors that you're focused on right now well um i think a, a, a really exciting sector that we work in is hospitality um, hospitality um, for us means anywhere from downtown high-rise convention center hotels to you know remote destination resorts in the mountains or on the beach, um, in the desert. Um, that's um, fun stuff. It's always uh, stimulating to go look at new sites, um, tour new properties with clients, um, talk to them about appropriateness of what they think is a, is a great idea, um, investigating uh, market studies and doing some test fits and layouts. Um, I think um, hospitality right now is changing so fast, um, you know, and you can almost draw a line in, in history, right? At um, September 2008, there was a lot of stuff going on in the hospitality world, especially in the resort destination market. Um, when Lehman Brothers um, folded, um, there were multiple, multiple projects that folded, that were being financed by them that folded along with it. And I think that really collapse of the travel industry for a couple of years. It's been coming back, but it's coming back in almost like a reborn type of way. There was, um, before that time, resorts were kind of themed. It was always, you know, um, kind of trying to meet expectations, but not exceed expectations of the traveling public. So if you were going to Hawaii, you know, clients wanted the Polynesian kind of looking thing. And if you're going to um, the wine country, they wanted a Tuscan looking thing. And, and I think um, the authenticity of new developments is, is really stimulating and really exciting. You know, no one wants to go um, to a new country or a new city and, and find that that hotel is exactly like the last one they stayed at in a different country. Um, there used to be kind of a standardization across the 
um, industry that doesn't exist anymore. Um, operators and owners are really striving to create unique experiences, the hotel to be sort of a, a portal or a window to the location it's in, whether it's an urban um, condition where, you know, the, the hotel is set up to kind of curate that experience of exploring that urban environment, or if it's, you know, on the desert and the, and the hotel is set up to allow people to get out into um, that environment and understand it, learn some environmental appreciation, um, learn a little bit of, you know, science, geology, you know, whatever they're interested in. Um, I think the traveling public really wants those kinds of experiences. And I think, um, you know, we're lucky enough to work in places that offer, you know, you know, really unique locations. And we try to really understand those locations and really do what we can as you know, building designers and, and site master planners to um, make sure that we facilitate those kinds of discoveries. You know, it's not um, used to be the, the mantra was, you know, get, a, get them in the door and keep them in. So you had the bars, the restaurants, everything. And the idea was uh, the guest revenue was all supposed to be spent there. And I think um, uh, operators are understanding that if, if guests come there um, and have an experience that they can't have anywhere else, it doesn't necessarily need to be on site even, um, but just the, the social media and the buzz that can be easily generated by excited people is so much more valuable than just those kind of F&B dollars at the moment. What kind of design tools right now, experimenting with anything new or something that you're excited about that you're just like, wow, this is incredible, or, or you just love the traditional medium, which there's, those are hard to beat? Oh, well, um, you know, I think uh, they, they are all tools. And I tell my team and, and our designers, you know, I don't care what tool you use. Um, just as long as you are good at it and can communicate ideas. I've got young people that, you know, prefer hand drawing and, and sketching. And I've got um, some senior level people that are really on the cutting edge of using a, a building information model and bringing it into rendering software and doing you know, animations and fly throughs. Um, we've got other um, designers that are super um, smart and really lean you know, between the artistic and the scientific side of the architect's brain really lean toward the scientific, but they're at the same time, fantastic designers. There's um, software tools that allow them to, you know, parametrically design um, and come up with things that, you know, you really can't do any other way. And, um, you know, the HKS as a firm is, you know, we try to be innovative on those fronts. So it's not just doing uh, pretty pictures and cool looking stuff, but we also, you know, have a couple of patents and figuring out how to get that stuff built. Speaking of innovative models, I was looking on your website and I think Ariana had mentioned this when she made the introduction to us that, that and scheduled this interview is that HKS has an R and D group. You also have a real estate practice and in-house economists. How much do you know about those parts of the business? Can you tell me a bit about those and how those function in the workflow of HKS? Um, yeah, collectively, um, that group is, is what we call the enterprise group. Um, so there is the, the R and D group that is really was started as part of the healthcare group. So in healthcare, um, um, healthcare companies are always looking ways for ways to, um, you know, not only gain efficiencies in what they do, but to really, um, explore wellness and patients and what can the built environment do, um, on those fronts, um, but also, you know, in a hospital situation, you know, nurses have um, certain rounds they do and, and they have to be, um, we don't want them walking any further than they actually have to be. So we develop some tools that allow us to measure um, those kinds of metrics and that R&D department has now kind of evolved into its own thing. So um, problem solving um, is now expanding from just the healthcare to, um, hospitality, sports, um, and, and some of the larger scale multifamily residential that we work on. Um, we have a group called Line that works more on um, innovation in the building, manufacturing, and construction. So taking a parametric design and figuring out how to build that in a way that um, meets the budget and the general contractor can understand and 
um, people on the site can actually put together. It's kind of what they're charged with. They um, are always experimenting. They've got a materials lab. They've got some real scientific people on board that understand how things go together, material strengths, you know, and what, what can we do um, to exploit some of those things that maybe aren't happening anywhere else. I think the, um, the real estate arm, we actually um, bring them to the table. We, we have developers that are, um, you know, interested in maybe some early financing to get projects off the ground. Um, we introduce them to our, our development group who has their own um, funding source where they can um, at times put in equity, equity to a project or help us out working out a deal where perhaps our fee is part of the equity. You know, if that all makes sense, um, we're very open to those kinds of things as well. Um, we have an economist um, that sits in our London office. He is more devoted to the hospitality group. Um, hospitality is a, a very complicated uh, financial business. Um, and he, he helps some of our um, less experienced owners, you know, really understand that, you know, understand markets and, and question, you know, even is this the right project? Does this make sense? Um, is the program even right? And, and his job is to kind of um, run a, a mathematical check, I guess you could say, on, on some of the assumptions that um, are, are on the table early in the process. So, Tom, when you're meeting with your two partners there, the running that the, the management of the office, what are the topics of conversation that you're constantly discussing from a strategic level? What kind of concerns are you talking about in those meetings? Um, that's a really good question. <laughs> um, just why, um, besides the top secret stuff. You know. yeah, of course, uh, any top secret stuff you want to share, we're all ears. <laughs> Um, well, I guess, I think the, um, you know, we have, um, generally we have big discussions about the direction of this office. You know, we, um, are about 45 people. Um, we have multiple sectors. Some are represented by, um, many people and some are represented by a couple. We talk about the appropriateness of that. How can we grow those smaller sectors? You know, how big do we want this office to be? Um, currently, um, we team with a lot of other offices, especially in the Western region. Um, we, you know, because of staffing issues or because of where the location of the project is, um, the San Francisco HKS office is what we call a center of excellence for hospitality. There's four of those across the company, Dallas, um, Miami and London are the other three. So for the Western region, um, the hospitality um, kind of brain trust is here in the San Francisco office. So, you know, you can imagine Denver, Salt Lake City, Phoenix, LA, there's a lot going on there as well. So we team with those offices. Um, we talk a lot about uh, staffing, um, trading staff, sharing staff, training um, other staff throughout the company um, to become experts as well in hospitality. Um, so there's strategy things like that. Um, there's also, um, we kind of try to divide and conquer the local um, community and um, uh, community and kind of industry functions. You know, who's gonna take what? Um, there's ULI, there's the Bay Area Council, there's SPUR, you know, there's multiple organizations and we can't all do everything. Um, and then we talk a lot about, you know, how do we um, how do we encourage and support some of our more senior people so that they understand um, long term, you know, they're going to be replacing us, um, and what do they need to know now so that when that happens, they're well prepared um, and are excited about it. Got it, Tom. Where where do you feel personally that you're growing in your career right now? I think my Personal growth right now has a lot to do with Ariana being here in the office. Um, you know, she has a completely different approach to business development and marketing than I've ever really seen before. Um, I think it's fantastic. She's really helping me um, understand what's important, what's not important. You know, we have a lot of discussions about um, potential clients and whether they are actually are potential clients or are they just wasting our time. Um, we um, travel. We've, we've kind of created a, a, a little roadshow that we 
once a month, we'll hit a new city, um, search for um, potential clients, visit with um, existing clients. And um, she's really giving us some discipline on those fronts. And I think that's um, a real growth for me right now as a designer. That's not something I've done a lot of. I used to go to a lot of conferences, which um, had some value as far as building a network. But I think the the one-on-one -on -one visits are much more important once you have that network in place. Um, I think um, on the design side, um, you know, I really am challenging our uh, senior and intermediate level designers to push um, and innovate on each project. Um, you know, we we try something new on every project. You know, whatever it might be, we'll we'll kind of write a headline for it. And then that'll be um, kind of our guiding light, I guess, if you will, for um, innovation. Tom, what question, if there is one, haven't I asked that you wish I would have? Let's end up there. Let's see. Uh, I guess I was expecting, um, you know, from the title of your podcast, The Business of Architecture, a little bit more on the financial side. Um, not that I'm any great expert in it, but there are um, some really interesting um, metrics that a lot of um, people don't think about in, when it comes to architecture business. Um, you know, we have in the Bay Area kind of a fixed envelope for our office, it's about 50 people, um, you know, and some very simple metrics, you know, if, if each employee can earn 50 or, um, you know, $200,000 $200, a year, and we have 50 people, you know, that's a $10 million capacity of fee um, every year, which is, I think, a, a common way to look at it. I think um, we also look at it, though, um, you know, we have 45 people here, we're paying for 50 seats. So we actually um, are not earning the capacity that we could be. And I think that's one of the, um, you know, kind of interesting things on the financial side about the business is fine tuning that. Um, you know, you don't want to grow bigger than the fee you have, but at the same time, you can't get more fee till you get more people, um, or you just work people um, over time. You keep bringing in work. You're not expanding your capacity. You're sort of expanding the number of hours people work, um, and that, you know, is is demonstrable in the in the data that that is a short term solution drives people out, leads to burnout, um, and it, it leads to a kind of an unsatisfactory work environment for a lot of people. And what is, I'm glad you brought up the metrics. I wasn't, this is a surprise to hear a, a design person talking about metrics, KPIs, fantastic, you know, key performance indicators. Mm -hmm. What What are some, you mentioned there's a couple interesting ones. You did mention that is interesting, sort of the capacity of the office compared to the number of seats and the revenue generated per employee. Any other metrics there that you think are pretty interesting that, that we'd love to hear about? Um. Well, I think, you know, um, I've, I've been uh, partners at a couple of smaller firms in San Francisco. Um, and it's, there's a lot of similarities, but working at a, a large firm, um, you know, it's, it's much more complicated. HKS has um, an added, I've also worked for other large firms here in San Francisco, and, and HKS has a little bit of a different attitude about sharing staff across firms. Um, you know, buying um, uh, buying help from another office in some companies is almost like um, issuing an RFP to a subconsultant, where there has to be a proposal and, and a scope of work in place and agreement and et cetera, et cetera. And in, in my experience, that's very um, inhibitive process to um, sharing staff. So I've seen companies that you know one office or one region is laying off and another region is hiring and it's it's uh, not the same people. So um, what we try to do is balance that staff across the company. Um, so if we need help, we can reach out to people that you know we uh, work with in LA or other Western region. We can go back to the Dallas headquarters and ask if there's people available. Um, but that process also creates a little bit of havoc on the bottom line because you're then um, you're you're not getting free or you know, you're not getting free labor. You're still paying for the overhead of those employees from the other offices. So those fifty that fifty seat 
maximum that I talked about um, actually increases because you can um, reach out to other offices. So it's not a finite number, it's a flexible number. But then when you're doing your year-end budgeting or your quarterly look behinds and look aheads, um, it's really, really hard to um, factor that into the equation. So we have a, kind of a brilliant CFO that helps us through those things. Um, I'm not saying I really understand it, he does, um, but it's, it's just kind of an interesting uh, thing for me to kind of be discovering. What other important metrics are you looking at? Well, um, I think like any firm, you know, we look at staff utilization. You know, that's a, another balancing act. We want to make sure that people have a good live work or, a, you know, kind of a personal life and professional life balance. Um, you know, if we see people's utilization, you know, north of 95% consistently, um, I think there's something wrong. And we need to, we, we kind of check into that. You know, it's, that's... Um, someone who's only got one or two hours a week for, for um, other pursuits. Uh, I don't mean, you know, going to the dry cleaner, but, you know, doing some research or, um, you know, calling some friends and colleagues or, you know, working on your own network, you know, things that are directly related to our bottom line, but are not necessarily billable hours. We want to make sure people have time for that, that they feel they can participate in some of the committees and focus groups that the firm has, you know, throughout the region and the world, um, or participate in some of the um, uh, kind of uh, community um, committees that are even operated out of the Dallas office. We like to have representation there. And those things take time, and we want to make sure and allow that, that there is that time to have that happen. Any other important metrics that you haven't talked about? Uh, well, you know, there's a million of them. <laughs> but I think those are, those are the, the big ones. I think, you know, um, year-end bonusing and profit sharing and all of that kind of stuff is at more of the shareholder level. Um, how that all gets handled. There's been some tax code changes recently that um, you know, we're still trying to get our head around a little bit um, as far as what it, what it means and how do we um, take advantage of maybe some new rules. Um, you know, those kinds of things are, I think, ever-changing and, and you know, I'm just glad I'm not in charge of that part of it. <laughs> Well, great. Well, Tom, it's been a fantastic conversation. Thank you for joining us today on Business of Architecture. Thanks, Ian. Appreciate being here. And that is a wrap. As a podcast listener, I'd like to invite you to two free online educational seminars for firm owners. The first teaches you how to structure your firm to avoid the overwhelming fires that plague so many firm owners. If you're ready to move from overwhelmed operator to excited owner, Visit businessofarchitecture.com forward slash freedom webinar to access this free online training. The second seminar you can access shows you how to attract your ideal clients to your firm consistently day in and day out. Go to architectwebinar.com to access this training. The views expressed on this show by my guests do not represent those of the host, and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, pledge, warranty, contract, bond, or commitment except to help you conquer the world. Carpe diem.